So, Holy Cup, and welcome to another episode here for the Funk Report, Mindful Media and Communication. And as you know, if you follow the podcast, uh, and as you can also guess from the headline or the name, the title of this episode, we're talking sports again. We're talking NBA, and you know I'm always happy when I can talk sports, especially NBA, as I'm a huge NBA fan. So this time around, um, the playoffs are in full swing, full effect, playoff mode in full effect. Um, so I thought it's, it's interesting to look at like how are players, teams, pundits communicating during the playoffs. We just, we are in the first week of the playoffs, like the first round of playoffs. We just saw two teams getting swept, which, um, are now exited. One of them being the Phoenix Suns. We will talk about this in just a, just a second from a communications point of view. So I'm not reviewing the games and who played well and who didn't, um, cause who would I be to, to argue and to criticize them? I'm no Stephen A, who has huge basketball pedigree. <laughs> um, just talking, Stephen A, don't yell at me. Oh, yell at me. Shout out the podcast. Um, I look at this from a communications point of view. Okay. Second team to be swept just to complete it was just right now before I started recording uh, the New Orleans Pelicans, but that's really no, no surprise, I think, from, from, my, from my amateur point of view. Okay, let's jump into it. Um, communications in the NBA playoffs 2024, the good, the bad, the ugly, so to speak. Okay. Um, so I'm going to try to apply a few key media theories again, like I do in every podcast episode to just explain how things work in the media and communication wise. Okay. Um, the first part I want to talk about is one thing though, that I find very interesting. And I think there's also one thing that's not being discussed enough or, considered to be important enough in, in sports but also in the real world, which is team dynamics. Yeah, no matter from like early age, kindergarten, uh, primary, high school, university, where I work and teach for sure, but then also in the real world, you always have to operate in teams. You never, barely ever by, your, by yourself all alone, right? And in basketball, team sports, of course, team dynamics are incredibly important. And here I just want to pick two examples. And one, the Phoenix Suns, because it's just like, and I don't mean to put X weight on the, on the Phoenix Suns. When I grew up watching basketball, the Suns were kind of cool. Danny Ainge, Charles Barkley. So I, I don't have anything against the Suns, and I would love to see the Suns doing better, okay? Just to, that, so that it's out there. But with your two and a, and a half picks, <laughs> like uh, the big, Two and a half. Um, uh, uh, you expect more than a first round sweep, right? Like to the Minnesota Timberwolves of all of all um, franchises, they play fantastic basketball this season. But I mean, just if you look at the names, you're like, what? Huh? Um, so that's one example. The Phoenix Suns, and on the other hand, I want to show the Dallas Mavericks. Okay, I, I'll explain in a second why. So Phoenix Suns first, right? You have Kevin Durant, Devin Booker, super mega stars, then. Trade deadline, they got they got a Bradley Beetle. So they have like, if you look at the payroll, three three mega stars, right? I think they all get around $50 million or something. Um, but it did not work, right? It didn't work. And that's a team dynamics thing, okay? There's like communication within the team. Who communicates with whom? How do you communicate with each other? Now, as soon as the, the, they were swept, as the game was over, two hours later or so, Shams, like a NBA reporter, reports that Kevin Durant apparently not happy that he was just basically stuck to being a corner shooter uh, during the playoffs. Like, why would you leak that to anyone two hours after you got swept, right? Is Kevin Durant, like, trying to get, like, trades going again, for example, because that's his thing, right? Um, so it's just a communication thing. Right? And it will affect the team, of course. The team's not happy. The team doesn't gel. The team doesn't fight for each other. Um, that affects management, of course, the, how they think about the team, how they think about players. That affects the fans, how the fans see the players. Do the players try everything? Do they play hard? I think Bradley Beal only had like, I don't know, I mean, you don't always, or only want to look at the scores, but I think he had less than 10, I don't know, less than 20 points for sure. I'm not sure about the last game anymore. Um, so that all affects the whole team chemistry, how the people, the fans perceive the team and how the media perceives the team. The, from a media point of view, now people in the media, we're saying like, hey, 
look at them. Kevin Durant already like two hours after the game is already like sub, not tweeting, but sub messaging people, telling them like, hey, it was, it was stupid. I wasn't happy. They just put me as a corner shooter. Uh, so now we see like, hey, things are not working there. And then we keep talking about it. We're like, what's wrong with the Phoenix Suns? And then the more people in the media talk about it, then Stephen A, Stephen A going out and like, that's the end of the Suns team. And you know, the, the kind of like a vicious circle starting right there, right? On the other end, we have the Dallas Mavericks. In the beginning, when they traded for Kyrie Irving, everybody and their grandma was like, oh, Kyrie Irving and Luca it never fit. They're, they're too similar. They're playing like the same position. It can never fit. And now they're having fun on the court. They seem like best buddies. Yeah, they lost the last game to the Clippers, whatever. Clippers are a great team too. So okay, that, that, that happens, right? Um, but they're gelling. They're fighting for each other. You know, like one goes down, the other one runs across the court to help him up. That's team dynamics. And if the big stars doing that for each other, for all the team members, for other players on the team, then everybody else will do the same for them and for everyone else involved. Right? So the Dallas Mavericks seem like a team right now. The Phoenix Suns don't. And I find this very interesting. You know? How, how like two stars that are said to be difficult, Kyrie Irving, Luka Doncic, how they are now gelling because it seems like they're putting the main goal above anything else and that makes them better. Luka Doncic won the, the scoring championship this, this season, right? The best the man player with the most points made this season. So... It's amazing to see how team dynamics influence, how communication influences team dynamics and how that influences the overall outcome. Because now people in the media talk about the Mavericks, like, yeah, that's a real team. They fight for each other. Great additions at the trade deadline. They're all fitting very well. They're communicating well. They're helping each other. They're there for each other. They're great other. They're, even if it doesn't work out right now, but maybe it will, but they have a great team also for the next season and so on. So everyone's like buying into the Mavericks and how they communicate. They almost came back from a 30-point deficit last, in the last game, right? So because of their fighting spirit and being there for each other while the Suns go on. Four zero swept. See you later. Yeah, it's, it's very, from an outside point of view, very interesting to see how the communication is influencing all those things. Okay? And if you look a little bit deeper there, um, we can look at, like, Transaction analysis a little bit. I, I, I will explain, right? So if you, if you dissect the, the communication failures with the Phoenix Suns, right? Just sticking with the example. You can apply this to other teams too, but the Suns are just a, a go-to example as of recording time. So apologies if you're a Phoenix Suns fan. Um, but if you look at like the, the, the psychological roles, like, like even like parent-adult-child roles, if you, if, you, if you will just entertain me for a second, right? Like, like we have like Durant, Booker, Beal, right? They, they, they shift between like those different roles. Like, like one time, Kevin Durant is the grown-up, um, the one who cares about everything. Then, then Devin Booker is the grown-up. Then Kevin Booker is like the, the adult in that relationship. Then maybe Bradley Beal is like the child in that relationship. And then, but their, their roles are always switching. Like then in the next game, Bradley Beal is, is like shouldering the efforts and is the parent or the adult, if you will. And then David Booker is like all poundy and is the child, for example. Uh, so this, this role shifting, and while it's important that different players, of course, like shoulder responsibilities, but like not knowing the role, like KD saying, like they put me as a spot up corner shooter, for example, right? So that leads to conflict in relationships and also within teams. Um, so and it also leads to misaligned expectations. If I'm KD, I'm like, I'm the best player on this team. Like, why would you put me in the corner? Like, coach, why would you put me in the corner all the time? I'm, I'm, huh? like, it leads to like, like misaligned expectations and might and also undermine the team effectiveness. You know? Communication from coaching side, incredibly important. I, don't, I mean, I, I, I don't even have to say that, but it's incredibly important, of course, from a coaching style, uh, side to be able to communicate well. Like, why am I making you do this and that now? And you have to know that some players need a big detailed explanation as to why you make them do certain things, while others, they just... They don't want to hear it. They're like, just tell me what to do. That's okay. That's enough. Tell me what to do. Okay, finish. I'll do it. All right, so you have to find the right balance and know how to talk to different players. So it's very, very difficult, very critical to be a good communicator if you want to be a good coach. Okay. 
So if you look at like those different roles within the team, and um, you can see like how crucial it is for different team members to to maintain like those in this example those consistent adult roles, um, which focuses more on rational decision making, which is important if you have like high caliber players. Decision making should be rational, not like childish. Like be the child, so to speak, in the relationship. Like, no, I want to do this, I want to do that. Uh, they didn't let me do what I want to do. <laughs> okay. Right? So that is important. That it exp explains a little bit of the of the, the struggle. And on the flip side, to finish, like, with the, those two examples on the Maverick side, like, this just demonstrates that um, the theory of social learning is also very important to team success. Okay, so of course you see those interactions between Kyrie and Luca like on, but also off the court, they're like a live demonstrations for teammates who then observe them and who emulate it. They're like, like I said earlier, they're seeing like, hey, our two superstars are, are doing this. They're like hanging out off the court, they're talking games and life and stuff. We, we can do that too. And then they communicate play strategies and so on much better because they have a much better understanding. So Kyrie Irving, Luka Doncic, like the role model, so to speak, for the rest of the team. And if they do it and they're playing hard and they're communicating well and they're deaf for each other, then so will be the others, which is just fantastic. So that's called social learning. You learn from your social surroundings, so to speak. Okay, so great job so far. Also, and that doesn't happen a lot, uh, props to James Harden for communicating. Yeah, you wonder why. The last press, press conference when um, the after the Clippers won, almost almost messed up their 30 point lead. Um, someone asked him, like, how did this happen? And he said, like, well, you see t just two great teams with great scorers playing against each other. It's showtime. That's what happens. Duke Doncic is awesome. Kyrie Irving is awesome. I can score. Paul George can score. And it's just nice to see a high caliber player giving props to their own team, but also to the opposing team. It's not like, yeah, we played terribly. No. He's like, no, no, we played well. They played well, too. They're very good, too, which is just a nice way. You don't see that often in pro sports right now to actually give props to everybody involved. That made me actually like James Harden a little bit more again. Um, well done, Beard. Well done, James Harden. I agree. I agree, and it's a nice thing to, to do this because it also elevates your own your own performance, like, no, no, they're really good. But we beat them. So then that makes you really better, right? So you want to prop up the opponent because if you say they're good and then you beat them, then that makes you better. So that's smart. It's polite. It's not the right thing to do. So props to James Harden for um, communicating there. If you look at a few more, like, coaches and players, just as a few examples that, that, I, that I wrote down that I wanted to talk, talk, talk about, and I want to look at like media narratives a little bit and maybe a little bit of like framing theory if you want to indulge me for a second. Um, the new superstar on the horizon or on, on the scene, right? Anthony Edwards. I mean, he's fully arri arrived now, of course. He's everywhere. And I, I love him too. Like, I, I can't escape the Anthony Ed Edwards show uh, neither. Um, and if you look at like the narrative theory a little bit here, it, it, the, the narrative revolves around Anthony Edwards like super enthusiastic, Genuine demeanor, right? He's like, you get what you see, right? He's very excited, very like he's, I think he's 22 or something. Like he's very like, yeah, let's go. Ah. And you're like, oh my God, that's so cool. He, he's playing, he plays very hard. He's very determined, very dedicated. And he wants it. And he, he just tells you what he thinks. And that's, that's fantastic. You don't get it a lot, right? Because like people like LeBron, more than a second, like very measured very like, oh, let me, I, I, they already have in their, in their heads media training and so on. They know what they say, how they say it, which words to use. While Anthony Edwards is like, in one of the last press conferences, they ask him about like his goals or whatever. He's like, I'm going to kill everything in front of me. I don't care. I want to kill everything in front of me. It's my favorite. KD is my favorite player. I want to kill the dude. <laughs> and that's what you want to hear. It's like, yes. And he doesn't say it in a, in a derogatory way or in like demeaning way or anything. He just says, I want it so bad now I'm going to do everything I need to do, I can do to be successful. And if that means I have to kill KD, my favorite player in the world, I will do that. Fantastic. And he says it with a smile on his face. And when you see him play, he plays very hard and he trash talks and everyone's trash talking, but he always has this, this smile on his face. It really reminds you like a little bit of like Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, like hardcore competitors, but who enjoy the hardcore competition. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah, you're... You're shooting in my face. 
watch me. <laughs> and that's that's fantastic. That, and that's part of the communication, right? Like, how do you communicate? How do you communicate? If it's not working, your anger, your frustration, he doesn't yell at people like, oh, that sucks. He's like, guys, let's go. Let's go harder. Let's compete. We can do this. Oh, and then he, he's a role model moving forward. That's what you want to see. And seeing this from a 22-year-old is fantastic. Let's hope he's not getting derailed with like success like others before, <laughs> John Morant. So let, let's hope he can keep it together. But if he can keep it together, like I see big things ahead for, for Anthony Edwards, and I hope he, he continues communicating in, in that way, in this, this very unique, very honest, very authentic way, because as all the statistics show in, in marketing, wherever, like authenticity is something that like Gen Z and younger people relate to. I mean, me too, but especially younger people relate to authenticity. So... Stay authentic, Anthony Edwards. Stay authentic. You're really cool. It's it's a joy to watch you play and to also hear you talk. On the other hand, if you're looking like a bit of like framing, thing, like framing how certain things are going or have been going. LeBron James, after Game Three, I think it was Game Three of the the playoffs. You're like, hey, you're about to get swept. They didn't get swept yet. I mean, they didn't get swept. They didn't. They're not out yet. They're playing while I'm recording. Uh, game Five. They won game four. And you're, about, you're about to get swept, maybe. Um, but what's your feelings? And LeBron James was like, uh, in the end, it's just basketball. And that frames it in a, in a way like, hey, it wouldn't be that bad if we would get swept because it's just a game, which is understandable. You try to take the pressure off framing, right? You try to frame what's happening in a way that makes you feel better, that gets people on your side, that makes people agree with you and so on. Yes, However, as a basketball fan, I remember Michael Jordan. I remember Kobe Bryant. Kobe Bryant down 0-3. You think he would say it's just basketball? No, he would not. And as a basketball fan, you don't want to hear that. As a media professional, I understand what he's doing. As a basketball fan, you're like, what did you just say? Excuse me? I'm spending my hard-earned money to wear your jersey to come to the games. And that's what you, well, that's your attitude? Come on. Right, so the framing is, hey, don't be mad. It's just basketball. It's not that, that bad. There are more important things, which is true. But as a fan, in that moment, I don't want to hear that. I want to hear there's no chance in hell we're getting swept. We're going to play our behinds off to avoid getting swept. We will take this next game. Watch us. Or things like that, right? He didn't say it because, of course, like he's protecting his brand. He doesn't want to be too cocky. That he doesn't want. To, he m might have had doubts, so he didn't want it to come back and bite him in the behind. If he's like, "No, we're gonna take it," and then they get swept, and then it bites him in the behind. He didn't want that. So understand why he why he said like it's just basketball. As a fan, you don't want to hear it. And public perception, I think, wasn't that positive towards that. Also, pundits were like, "Ah," like Stephen A. was like. Well, what are, you, what are you saying there? Like, I mean, and so in this very moment, it's very, very important. In the grand scheme of things, basketball doesn't matter. In this very moment, for your fans, wearing the purple and yellow, the purple and gold, sorry, it's very important. Okay? And also, of course, it can influence team moral and so on, but luckily it worked. Maybe he, need, he wanted to take away the pressure from his, from his teammates, and maybe that, that worked, and that's why they won. So then... then Tip of the head to LeBron James. Um, I have two more things that I wanted to, to, to discuss in, in this regard very, very briefly, which is then also, of course, the impact of pundits and experts. I had a whole podcast episode. Check it out. It's in, on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, whatever you listen to. I'm on pundits and experts influencing um, athlete performance. So that, that's a previous episode. I just want to quickly highlight one more time that like, like the pundits and analysts, of course, they do shape especially public narrative. They might not influence how players think because players are like, yeah, I don't listen to the dude, like he's old, but whatever. But the public, of course, we are influenced by those talking heads, right? And of course, they all have their agenda. So then here the, the theory of agenda setting theory um, comes into play again, right? Their choices, their, their choice of the pundits of what to discuss, how to discuss it can influence the public perception and maybe even direct fan focus towards specific players, controversies, plays, and so on. For example, when it comes to the MVP race, right? Who's, who should be the MVP? Luka Doncic is like, like I said, has the most points, the 
points uh, this season, most, most points per game. Uh, the, the, he got the scoring award. Um, he plays better than ever, plays better defense than ever. Like his defensive stats are through the roof, even though people say he can't play defense. But every time they are, there's NBA on TNT, Shaq talks about uh, SGA, about like a clear MVP. And he never even mentions Luka Doncic. That's clear agenda setting theory. Shaq likes SGA. Apparently, he doesn't like Doncic that much. I don't know why or what, but yeah, agenda setting. He only talks about SGA. So, you no, know, SGA is the clear MVP. There's no one else in this discussion that's like agenda setting. Okay, my agenda is get this, get the attention to this guy, not to the other guy, as an example. Okay, and it's a very powerful role in, in setting like the public agenda because it also underscores the responsibility of media experts in shaping not just like fan conversations. But of course, you also influence player reputation and, and self-perception. So I hope that most players in the NBA, they're like, they are self-assured enough of like, eh, I don't need to listen to Charles Barkley talking about me. But fans definitely listen to Charles Barkley or to, to Shaq, um, Kenny to some extent, and Ernie, of course, um, when it comes to that, or Stephen A. in, in, in some regards. Um, Ankh. Uh, but yes, it, it, definitely, it definitely leads to like, how people are, players are being seen in the public. Right? So that's why pundits have such a huge impact and are that important. Even though you could say, yeah, they're, but they're only talking heads on TV. Yes, but they do influence the way we think, the way the audience, the media thinks about players, plays, teams, and so on. That's, and that's just why they matter so much. Um, last part is the, the obvious part, but I mean, as a fan, obviously we're, make, we're making our voices heard as well. And how do we do that? Mostly via social, social media. It's, we're not just passive consumers anymore. We're very active consumers, of course, right? So, of course, during the playoffs, even more so, even more like heated debates on social media, right? And that leads us to the last theory I want to throw at you, and it's one that we know if you listen to the podcast, the use and gratification theory. Right? Because fans use the platforms, social media platforms, to fulfill the needs for connection, for entertainment, for personal expression, and so on. So the active participation very often amplifies like, like specific player narratives or like team stories, like heat culture for the Miami Heat, for example. Right? Every, then every Heat fan uses a hashtag heat culture, for example. And that also then might impact the broader media coverage. So then Charles Barkley talks about, oh, that's heat culture, for example. Yeah? And then even like pundits take different approaches to discuss stories differently because it took off on social media, for example, because it got so much fan support. Like, in the game between Philadelphia and New York just, uh, like, a day ago or so, in Philadelphia, New York fans bought up, like, lots of tickets and then it sounded like a New York home game, even though it was in Philadelphia. And then this, of course, yeah, got lots of attention on social media, on mainstream media, pundits talk about it. So the fan interaction has a huge impact on how players feel, how players perform, how players see the game, how teams see the game, how teams see whether or not they have to do something. For example, that, that Philly fans don't care about their team <laughs> clearly is a clear message to like the, the, the team management that maybe the people they have on the roster aren't really ones that the people of Philadelphia identify with, <laughs> Joan and Beat. For example, right? Uh, or the other way around, that New York sees like, oh, wow, our fans are now really behind us and we got to keep this going with all means necessary, for example, right? So very, very important to read or fans, to listen to fan interaction, to see what they want, what they're doing, how they're doing it, and then to maybe, I don't know, use what you get from the fans to then drive the narrative forward, okay? So those are like just a few theories and a few approaches you could you could look at when you're consuming media, when you're using media in, in, in regards to the playoffs right now, sports in general, um, because it will happen over and over again. I will do one more episode, of course, after the, the finals, and of course, um, which will be won, and I'm predicting it right now. I hope not by the Nuggets again. No offense to Nikola, Nikola Jokic, of course. Um, but it's enough Nuggets now. And now the Celtics... Oh, I should have more. Like, I will do one more episode. I just I'm thinking about it right now. I will do one episode about like how teams are perceived in the public eye based on how they communicate or whatever. That, yeah, because who likes the Celtics besides Boston fans, for example, right? We will talk about this. Okay, two more episodes coming in regards to to NBA basketball this season. One finals wrap up. How how the communication um, happened now from 
the first week of playoffs now moving forward to the finals and to the champions then and then I will do one more episode on like how teams are perceived in the public eye based on their communication styles and um, how they behave, so to speak. Okay, that's going to happen. Let me know what else you want to know. Let me know who you're rooting for. Um, in the comments, leave some reviews. It really helps to like get more people involved in the discussion, which we all want, of course. Until then, like, share, subscribe. You know the drill. Um, yeah, take care. If you're not in the US, like me, and you're watching NBA basketball, wake up early, stay up late. Um, <laughs> Protect your your dark your dark eyes. Um, we we'll talk soon. Until then, stay safe. Take care. Sorry, cup.